Welcome, everyone. This is week number seven of the eight-week MBE crash course. The class just did a 25-question review, and it went pretty well. And we even did some crim law questions. So I'm going to make sure that everyone gets access to those explanations. And I think it was really great to simulate the test-taking environment. We'll do something similar next week. Just a reminder, next week class will be from 9 to 12, and then from 2 to 5 as we give everyone the opportunity to watch the Super Bowl. And since we are a bird-based organization, we have no choice but to root for the Eagles. Um, morning lesson plan, 25 question quiz, student check-in. Um, I tried that, it's pretty silent, but thumbs up, right Grace? Principles of criminal law. When I took the MBE the first time, and over the next couple of years, I'm, I'm planning on taking the bar exam many times. Um, I walked away from the MBE learning that one, I need to brush up on hearsay. And two, there was a lot of questions on murder. I was a little bit shocked to see how many questions there were about murder. So let's start today in cold blood murder. Um, crim law approach. So crim law is split between crim pro and crim law. That makes it kind of like interesting. You know, they're not gonna test they don't have the opportunity to, to test as many different things. They can only test, you know, 12 or 13 questions per each uh, subject. Because I know in, in law school, I had crim pro and sub crim as different classes, right? So it's two separate classes tested in one. That's why I kind of think it's one of the easier subjects because if you know the basic laws, then you should be able to get most of the questions right. Um, is it crim law or crim pro? If it's crim pro, uh, which amendment or right is being tested? You know, the right of the criminally accused. We have these certain rights that are constitutionally protected, mostly by the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment. And is it being implicated? And, and what should their right be if they're being accused? Um, if it's criminal law, which, which crime is being tested, right? Is it gonna be a specific or general intent crime? Um, is it an inchoate crime or a complete crime? And if it's an inchoate crime, will it merge? You know, just kind of understand what, you know, maybe look down at the answer choices and you see the different theft crimes and just put them in your mind. What are the differences between them? Try to address these questions before you even answer them by just framing yourself of, are we in crim pro world? Are we in crim law world? And are they asking me between theft crimes or murder crime, you know, try to just like understand what's going on. Specific versus general intent is very important, especially for attempt, right? Attempted murder or attempted uh, uh, battery, which would be an assault, right? If, if we're looking at assault as an attempted battery, if we have that attempt element, then it's a specific intent crime and you actually have to be intending to do the thing. It can't be that you know, it just came about. If you, you have to have that specific intent. And one thing that is interesting about attempt too that I've, I've seen many times is um, factual impossibility will not be a defense, right? Like just because you tried to do something and it was factually impossible for you to complete that, that doesn't really matter. If it's like a lawful impossibility, maybe your attorney told you it was lawful, maybe that's different. But if it's factual impossibility, you were trying to shoot somebody but your bullet didn't go that far, right? It's still attempted murder, even though your bullet didn't go that far, even though there's a factual impossibility. So kind of look for that for general versus specific intent. Um, I want to talk about murder and I always wanted to keep things relevant. So let's talk about two cases. Well, let me give you the, the facts first and then let's talk about two cases. First thing is all murders are homicides, but not all homicides are murder murder right but not all homicides are murder right do you understand what that means that you could have a manslaughter killing or you could even have just like a totally lawful killing that occurred but still a homicide a homicide is just a killing or an unlawful killing whereas a murder has to satisfy these specific requirements murder is the unlawful killing of another human being with malice of forethought the main type of murder that we see, well, not the main type, but the type of murder that everyone knows is first degree murder, is first degree murder, right? This is premeditation. This is like, I'm planning on murdering someone. I 
have it all in my head and then I go to murder that person. What if I go on the way to murder that person and I take a few shots of, of whiskey because I'm trying to like, am I really going to do it? No, I'm going to do it. Let me take a few shots and then I go murder. Could I claim intoxication as a defense then? No. Why not? Because you took it to like, you already had the intent at the beginning. You just took it to like calm your nerves. Exactly. If it's just to uh, calm my nerves, yeah, then the intoxication defense won't work. But think about that, how intoxication could be a defense to this specific intent crime. Murder in the first degree premeditated has to be a specific intent crime. Or it could accompany an enumerated felony murder, right? Like a burglary or robbery or some type of inherently dangerous felony that a killing occurs during this felony. Um, what about a co-defendant? Will a co-defendant be liable for your killing during a felony? Yeah. It depends, right? Yes, if it's of another person, if it's foreseeable, they could be liable. But what if uh, they're killed? Are you liable for the death of a co-defendant? Mm, no. No, not, the, not the, their death. So consider co-felons, consider murder, premeditated, first degree. This is like the worst type of murder. Now there's second degree murder, which is if it's not first degree murder, if it's not premeditated or an enumerated felony murder, then it's gonna be second degree murder, which could be, there's some felonies that, and you'll see in the fact pattern that are not enumerated felonies that it could constitute second degree murder, but usually it's gonna be depraved heart or intent to inflict serious bodily harm. Like if I stab someone in the heart and I'm not trying to kill them, but they die, that's gonna be second degree murder because I intended to inflict great bodily harm and they died. If I'm just like, go, oh, I wanna to go to Sears Tower, I heard it's super tall. And then I'm looking over it and I just, you know, throw a rock out of the tower and it lands on someone's heads and kill them. That would be second degree murder too, right? Because that's depraved heart. You're just like totally not even thinking. If I just go out and just shoot guns into the air, boom, 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 and someone dies, that's gonna be depraved heart murder, right? I think as a matter of course on the MBE, Always try to, not try to, but when in doubt, ratchet up the, the, the murder or the manslaughter. You know, like if you're between first and second or you're between manslaughter and murder, it's usually the higher one. Like try to argue why that would be the case. That's just my experience. Um, and then we have manslaughter, which is voluntary manslaughter, like adequate provocation. That always comes up with the, you walk in on your spouse with another woman, man, non-binary or artificially intelligently created creature. And you have not no choice, but adequately you are provoked into killing. That would be manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter is like criminal negligence. Can someone give me an example of involuntary manslaughter? Like driving drunk. Mm -hmm. Drunk driving usually am amounts to involuntary manslaughter. So there's two cases that I wanted to talk about that one I know more of and the other, I guess we're going to find out about today. But does everyone know what this case is? Nipsey Hussle. Does anyone know who that is? He's a, a, a musician, a rapper, and he was shot by this guy named Eric Holder. And if you see the surveillance, this is what happens. The guy comes in, they have an argument, and, and Nipsey Hussle owns a clothing store in California. The guy, Eric Holder, who's a you know, former friend of him, his, I guess, walks in, they have an argument. Then the guy, Eric Holder, goes back to his car, gets his gun, comes back and shoots him. What do we think that is? Manslaughter or murder? I think that's murder. He had a second to cool down. Mm -hmm. It was determined to be murder. But to be honest, it wasn't so clear cut. Right, they had to look at the surveillance and see, was he adequately provoked? And how much time before he went back to his car, right? It was a real serious question. Now, that's a good, good job, everyone. Now, what about this other guy, Alec Baldwin? Does anyone know his story? Yeah. Shot, oh, go ahead, can someone explain it? He, uh, he shot a pop gun thinking that it was blanks, but it actually shot and it hit the cinematographer. 
and it killed her. So what did he get charged with? He got charged with manslaughter. And what was the argument for and against him being guilty of manslaughter? Um, I don't really know. Like, I didn't really too much into it. I just know like, what they charged him with. Did they convict him? No, that's just happening. Like, the charges just dropped a few days ago. What? Does yeah, anyone else have any update? What? Well, apparently he... I don't know. I think it's criminal. It's criminal. It's involuntary manslaughter what he did because they were taking into account the amount of years, um, you know, in in so, the industry. So what it comes down to, right? It was a prop gun. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was no way he would have known that it could have had the potential to kill someone. Then you know, it's hard to argue that it was even negligent or let alone criminally negligent. But then again, what kind of idiot points a prop gun at someone and shoots them? I mean, I don't know. That's kind of the argument. Like the what kind and also of- also in his belt, he had real um, live bullets. So it's like- Yeah, I don't, belt, he had I don't know the specifics of the case to be honest, but like, it's a good argument here for, is he gonna be convicted of some sort of involuntary manslaughter right like he wasn't adequately provoked it's not first degree or second degree murder he has no deliberate premeditation and it's not depraved heart or intention there was no intention there it could only have been involuntary manslaughter and then the question for the jury that we're all you know i guess going to decide is the amount of negligence was he even negligent at all if he wasn't negligent at all then it really couldn't have been manslaughter right like he did nothing it's wrong it's like on a movie set so you don't like just automatically think that the guns are not going to actually shoot real bullets. So now Alita is saying in the chat that they did convict him of involuntary manslaughter. I don't think they did. I remember I we charged him like two weeks ago or something like that. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I thought so too. So yeah, it says five days. I just googled it. It says five days ago that he will be charged with involuntary manslaughter. He will be charged with it, but not convicted of it, right? Or he will. That's what I understood that he was charged, but yeah, as Alita was saying, there was somebody, there was the the gun prop um, person that was hired for the movie, who actually got convicted. I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, the person who loaded the gun with real bullets. Yeah, yeah that guy is going down. That thing, the problem for Alec Baldwin is that the prosecution is saying that it's known in the industry that you never do like point up gun. So you know. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, I don't know. It's a good argument. I mean, again, personally, I'm not a big believer in like taking people's freedoms away. Like, I don't think he meant it. We shouldn't throw him in jail. But like, I don't know. I'm not the long arm of the law. He did do something that if the family really wants to see justice, then maybe he does deserve it. Me, I would never seek justice on other people. I'm good. But anywho, Murder. We understand murder and manslaughter. Pretty tough, but it comes up a lot on the exam, right? I mean, not pretty tough, but just make sure you understand it. In Florida, there's a third degree murder, and they, they could tell you on the exam what are the elements of third degree murder, right? It could be very fact-specific fact where they give you a statute, and you just have to kind of interpret it and see, you know, was there a malice of forethought? Was it intent to inflict bodily harm or a numerate felony? Or was it... Uh, something different voluntary and voluntary manslaughter let's talk about theft crimes i think this is a good slide right i think this is a slide that helps people understand a lot of different theft crimes at its core larceny is like the simple theft like petty theft is larceny the taking of another's personal property with the intent to permanently deprive so what if i'm in the store and i look at this uh what was it that i want pair of shoes right gucci shoes and i'm like yo i'm gonna take these and i grab the gucci shoes i put them in my hand i start walking out the door and then i have that little moment of truth where they're like bro that's not a good idea put these shoes back and i put them back did i commit any crime larceny yeah you had the intent and you picked it up mm -hmm. okay now what if i see my friend Grace walking by 
and she's carrying this Louis bag. And I'm like, yo, that's my Louis bag. I have been looking for that Louis bag. And I snatch it from her. Is that larceny? Larceny by trick? No, because you think that it's yours. No, I'm saying recovering. If I, yeah, that's Grace was getting at what I was getting at. If, when I'm taking it back from her, it's not going to be larceny because you have to deprive someone of something that you don't think is you have the right to deprive them of. If you're simply recovering your own property, even in burglary or larceny, that's not going to be sufficient. It has to be you're trying to take something and it just has to be a sufficient step. You don't have to actually even leave the store. So those are some elements of larceny that are interesting. What about, um, let's see, false pretenses. Obtaining title to another's property using false statements of past or existing fact with the intent to defraud. Whereas larceny by trick is obtaining possession of another's personal property using false statement of past or existing fact. Can anyone give me an example of larceny by trick versus false pretenses? What does title mean? It's like ownership. It's like title to your car, title to your house, like actual ownership, not just possession. So if you trick someone to signing a document and they think it's you know a standard document, but they're really signing over title to their car, that would be false pretenses. You trick them into giving you actual ownership of it. If you just trick them into giving you the possession of something, you know, like, you know, uh, give me these, uh, these items and um, you'll have good luck for seven years. You know what I mean? And then they give them to you and you're like, ah, I'm just kidding. Remind now that's going to be larceny by trick. It's got to be larceny by trick is very similar to larceny. It's just some trick involved. Larceny is very similar to robbery it's just there's no force involved, right? These are all very similar crimes, but larceny is just taking, false pretenses is obtaining title, larceny by trick is obtaining possession, embezzlement, fraudulent conversion of another's personal property by one in lawful possession. So embezzlement, you know, I already had like a control of this. I, it was, I was in charge of the account receivable and then I just directed the funds to, to me. You know, I did the, the old Sam Bankman Freed or whoever is your typical embezzler of the day, right? That's what embezzling is. Robbery is forced larceny. Wrongful taking another's personal property from his person or presence by force or threat of injury with the intent to permanently deprive. So simply put, assault or battery plus larceny, right? Now, here's the situation. Andrew, Mr. Big Bad Andrew, walking around the block and I see someone uh, who has some cool, uh, he has a, a cool bag. And I walk up to him and I rough him up and I snatch the bag. Now I'm being charged with robbery and larceny. Can I be convicted of both robbery and larceny in this situation? No, don't they get merged? Or it's no. like a defense that gets merged into it? They're going to be merged. And the reason why is because larceny or robbery contains all of the elements of larceny plus that additional element. So you're just going to get uh, convicted of the higher crime. You can't also be convicted of the lower crime, right? And then burglary. Everyone loves burglary. Burglary, the breaking and entering into the dwelling house of another at nighttime with the intent to commit a felony therein. So... Everyone knows that that is just the common law definition of burglary, right? How has burglary, can someone tell me, been modified in present day? Uh, no nighttime. No nighttime. What else? It could be something other than a dwelling. <laughs> right, and something other than a dwelling house. Mm, so no breaking, also. And it's you're right, Grace. They've relaxed what it means to break. You know, if you just open the door, right? An unlocked door. You didn't really break it, but as long as you didn't have permission to walk into it, that would consist of a breaking and entering. 
if it's a store that's open to the public and you walk into the store and steal something, that's not going to be burglary because you didn't break into it because you were invited in. But if I walk around the neighborhood and I see someone's door is open and I walk into their house, that's probably going to constitute a breaking for the purposes of burglary. Um, it could also be into a car, right? It doesn't have to be a house. It doesn't necessarily have to be a house. It could also be a car. Does your hand, putting your hand through a window count? In what context? Probably. A house. Like somebody's window's open and you have the intent to commit a crime, but you put your hand through the window, but like you stop. Wait, you had the intent to commit the crime when you put your hand in the window. Put your hand through the window, that constitutes burglary, right? 100%, yeah. If I reach my hand into someone's house, whether or not I steal something or not, it's going to be burglary. Unless I had no intent to commit a crime, if I'm just reaching my hand in to feel how cool their house is compared to the sun you know, outside, that's not going to be burglary. But if I had the intent, that will indeed be burglary. And remember, same thing with larceny. If I burglarize someone's house to recover my own goods, that's not going to be a uh, burglary because I thought they were mine. Probably trespass, right? And remember, there's some torts like trespass that can also be criminal. Criminal trespass. Assault and battery, right? Could be uh, a tort or it could be a crime. In fact, look at it right now. Look, we got um, Dana White right here. So assault is, as a threat is a general intent crime. Assault as an attempted battery is a specific intent crime. And battery is an unlawful application of force to the person of another resulting in bodily injury or offensive touching. So assault as an attempted battery is a specific intent crime. Does anyone know, and I explained this earlier, why that's important about assault? You can't use intoxication as a defense. Right. There's a lot of things you can't use as a defense because you have to have um, the specific intent. No, I'm sorry. You can use you can use intoxication as a defense to assault as an attempted battery because you couldn't have formed the specific intent to do something if you didn't have the capacity. What are some other crimes that require specific intent? Does anyone know? I am confused here. Only if you take a uh, courage liquor, you remember you said intoxication. Right. So specific intent means that you have to have the specific intent to um, to complete the crime, not just the general intent. Like, you know, battery is a general intent crime. I could just be trying to assault someone. Like I'm gonna throw a punch, but not hit him. And I hit him, that's battery. Even though I didn't have the specific intent, I'll have the transferred intent. Or there could be, you know, so many other crimes that like, you don't need specific intent. You just need general intent, like second degree murder. Think about first degree murder versus second degree murder. Second degree murder, you do not need specific intent. It's just, you did something crazy that was um, a depraved heart. First degree murder, you do need a specific intent because um, you have to have that premeditated murder. So intoxication could be a defense to premeditated murder. Now, not if it was just you know a couple shots to cool you off, but if before you got drunk, you know, if you came up with the plan when you were drunk, well, you didn't have the capacity to premeditate and, and go through with the murder. So that's not going to satisfy the element of specific intent. Whereas even if you were drunk, if you drop a bowling ball off of the roof of a building and it kills someone, you're going to have satisfied that general intent. Whereas same thing with assault versus battery. Assault, if it's an attempted battery, it's a specific intent crime. You have to have the specific intent to assault someone. It can't be like you flailed your arms and, and almost hit someone. You weren't trying to do that, so it, it wouldn't be necessary. It's just something to know in the fact pattern. Again, like I said earlier, attempt is specific intent. You have to actually have the intent to attempt to do what you're doing. So there's questions we'll see this afternoon where that really comes into play. Um, all right, song battery should be pretty easy, though. Strict liability crimes, statutory rape, regulatory crimes, administrative crimes, morality crimes, such as statutory rape, bigamy, and polygamy. Anyone know what that means, strict liability? Regardless of whether you did it or not, you're being 
convicted? You don't have to prove causation. Yeah, intent, you're still being oh, charged. Right. Yeah. right, like statutory rape is the easiest way to think about it. There's no defense to it. You're strictly liable. I, she showed me her ID that said she was X, Y, you know, doesn't matter, right? I thought she was X, Y, Z, doesn't matter. I tripped and fell and you know, <laughs> doesn't matter, right? It's statutory rape, no matter what you have um, uh, satisfied the elements to be convicted, so long as you did the main thing. Arson, the malicious burning dwelling house of another, at common law, there can be no arson if you own the dwelling, but do not reside there. That's been abolished, right? Um, on the MBE, it, it doesn't have to be where somewhere else lives. It could be any dwelling house, even where you live. Most people these days, good old, good old fashioned arson, it's on your own house, right? And to collect the insurance, if I would guess, right? So that it, we've taken away that you can commit arson on your own house. Malicious with the intent or extreme recklessness, burning requires some damage to the structure caused by fire. Damage from smoke, water, explosions is not sufficient at common law. The dwelling house of another, but at common law, it doesn't have to be the dwelling house of another. And then damage are required. There must be charring or something more. Discolorationing, discoloration or blackening is insufficient. Anyone have any insights about arson from any questions they did? Or in general, any insights about assault, battery, theft, crimes, homicide at this point? I think that's the best way to go about criminal law. Any insights from any questions that we've done? Nothing really? Um, I did a question today, actually, in the morning that was the guy went into, went into a place wanting to commit arson, but then was lighting a match, or keep stop, and then lit a match, but his reflex like was to use, he lit the match in the purpose to read something. And, um, and then his reflex, he dropped the match and it fell and then it started burning and then he could have stopped it, but he didn't. Right there, it was arson when he didn't yeah, stop right it. There, when he didn't stop it, that's when, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that fact pattern as you said it. I knew it was about to happen. Yeah, like if you didn't have the intent and it was just your, you, you dropped your cigarette and then it blew up, you're not gonna become liable or guilty of arson. But if you had the intent and then you saw it about to burn and then you didn't do anything about it, you didn't put it out, definitely arson. Anyone else have any, I like that. Any um, insights, assault, battery, theft, Homicide from questions you remember? I have a question. What's up, Petey? So for arson, let's say uh, uh, someone uses a Molotov cocktail to like, you know, uh, throw at another person or something like that. Would that be arson? The malicious burning of a house by another. The only argument would be extreme recklessness, right? Because you didn't have the intent to burn it, but probably so. It does sound extremely reckless. If you throw a Molotov cocktail at someone, you miss them and it hits the house. That, that's the art. I mean, you'd have to look at the answer choices. You know, it's not clear cut from the fact pattern because it's hypothetical and there's no answer choices, but there is an argument that that's extreme recklessness that would indeed satisfy the first element of malice. But again, there's also an argument that it's, you know, some dude calls you a bad name. What else are you supposed to do but throw a Molotov cocktail? No, I'm just kidding. But like, you know, there's, there's an argument both ways right there. Does anyone think that would be arson or think that it wouldn't be arson, his example? Two people are fighting in the street. I obviously, one person throws a, a flaming thing at the other and it misses them and burns down someone's house. Yeah, I think that's extremely reckless. And then if it if it causes damage to a structure of any any kind, I guess then it's arson. For sure, I think it's probably extremely reckless. Um, any other questions or insights from arson? Uh, I was going to say um, the, the intent transfers and transfer intent, and I like that transfer intent. Now remember, transfer intent can be I tried to commit. I tried to punch Johnny, miss Johnny and hit Tommy, right? That's going to have the transfer intent necessary. At the same time, it could be, I tried to assault Johnny. My, my, my hands are a little off centered and I contacted him and created and hit battery. Then we could transfer the intent of 
assault to battery. So transferred intent can be person to person. Transferred intent could also be crime to crime, right? Okay. I was gonna say, cause I had got a question and somebody was trying to kill his neighbor and then that was first degree. And then he ended up shooting a cop behind him and it was still first degree because of his first degree intent to kill the neighbor. Mm -hmm. But similar question, shot, tried to shoot friend, miss friend, kills a cop. Now, is that capital murder because he killed a cop? Or just regular murder? It's at first degree. No, but this is a different question. I'm just giving a different hypothetical. If, if the person you actually hit was a police officer and there was a law on the land that if you kill police officers, you know, if you intentionally kill a police officer, intentionally kill a police officer, then it's gonna be capital murder. The answer to that hypothetical is probably no, because yes, you had the intent to kill someone and that transferred, so you would be guilty of first degree murder, but you didn't have the intent to kill a police officer, which was necessary under the statute that I'm making up of capital murder. Good, good points. Anyone else have any thoughts, things to mention? I just have one more, and it's with arson again. For sure. Uh, so uh, what if you lit uh, a trash, a trash bin on fire? I mean, I, I know it says dwelling, but you said like uh, that, that changes, uh, that change. Uh... Well, okay. That's an interesting question because it, then you could have, per se, right? It could be per se negligence that'll establish the extreme rec recklessness that amounts to m malice, right? Because if there's a, a, an ordinance in your town that says you're not allowed to burn trash and you burn trash and then it, you know, it burns someone's house down, then that's a really good argument. If you live in like the wild, you know, and burning trash is kind of a normal thing and it's like once, you know, it, it, it really is gonna come down to that extreme recklessness. I mean, you seem pretty creative with ways you could burn down houses, but at the end of the day, just know that intent is the main thing or extreme recklessness. Any other okay. questions? Anyone? Yeah, thank you, man. Definitely should have your rapper name be something related to arson. Um, all right, inchoate crimes. We know what this means. The intro at a crimes, no, the inchoate crimes, attempt, solicitation, and conspiracy. Remember that attempt and solicitation, oh shoot, attempt and solicitation will merge with the completed crime. That's the, don't, the slide needs to be updated. But attempt and solicitation will merge with the completed crime. Conspiracy will never merge. Please know that this was just to see if anyone was paying attention. And luckily I was. That conspiracy will not merge, right? Attempt and solicitation will merge. Attempt is just like, um, I tried to shoot someone, I missed them. Solicitation is like, Yo, Johnny, can you kill this person for me? And then conspiracy is like, Johnny says yes. Now him and I, him, Johnny and I have conspired to conspire. Um, what can people tell me about conspiracy? Because that is tested pretty deeply more than just one word. Any insights about conspiracy you've seen on the test? Yeah, um, that the, well, I don't know it from heart, but I, I can read it. It says that the common law conspiracy requires plurality of agreement and does not criminalize unilateral unilateral conspiracy where only one person actually agreed to commit the crime and the other only think the agreement. Right, the bilateral agreement. So if you have a uh, undercover police officer and I go up to him and I say, yo, Johnny, let's do this. And he says, yeah, let's do this, wink, wink. That's not gonna be conspiracy because he was not actually participating in the crime with me it would just be solicitation i solicited him but there was no true bilateral conspiracy also um we look at that overt act you know if you took a sufficient step we look at can you withdraw from a conspiracy and usually on the mbe i think it's too late you know the the conspiracy is already it's too late to, to back out now um what about another person who can be involved? What about the accomplice, the getaway car, right? The accessory, accessory after the fact is the getaway car. Accomplice is like your partner. Um, there's a question. Can, can the accomplice also be an accessory? Yeah, the accomplice can be an accessory. The accomplice is just like another yeah. person that's involved. The, in the, the car driver can be an accomplice. Yes. Okay. I had a weird question the other day. 
I robbed, you know, me and Johnny are going to the bank, right? And then I said, yo, Johnny, just drop me off. I got to get some cash. I walk into the bank. I come out, you know, guns blazing, sirens ringing, and I jump in the car. And I'm like, yo, Johnny, hit the gas. Let's go. And then Johnny hits the gas, drives away, and then drops me off at my house. Is he guilty of anything? Yeah, like the after. Yeah. 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 You would think he didn't do anything wrong, you know? But at some point, you should have realized, like, bro, you just robbed this bank. You know, I got to drive away. That's at least how that question went. I had an argument against it, but it, it lost. Okay. Let's talk about some insanity defenses. Uh, this is tough, right? They'll tell you on the test which type of insane defense is being raised, right? McNaughton, irresistible impulse, the combination, the model penal code, or the Durham test. The McNaughton is the defendant doesn't know right from wrong. Due to a mental disease or defect at the time of the offense, the defendant lacked the ability to know the wrongfulness of his conduct or understand the nature and quality of his act. For instance, I suffocated my wife, but I thought I was squeezing a lemon. Irresistible impulse. Defendant acted because of an impulse he could not resist. Due to mental illness, the defendant was unable to control his actions and conform with the conduct of the law. Irresistible impulse is you were unable to control your actions. McNaughton is you didn't know right from wrong. The model penal code is a combination. As a result of his mental disease, he lacked the capacity to either appreciate the criminality of his conduct, which would be McNaughton, or conform his conduct to the requirements of the law, which would be uh, irresistible impulse. Um, and then Durham test. But for his mental illness, he would not have acted. The, the defendant's conduct was the product of a mental illness. They sound similar. They'll tell you what it is, you know. Do we understand these four? Any questions about these four? McNaughton is you don't know right from wrong. Irresistible impulse is you couldn't resist. Model penal code is both, is either you didn't know right from wrong or you couldn't resist. And the Durham test is your actions were a product of your mental illness. They can overlap a lot. It's just, if you're gonna learn one thing before the test, this could be it. Okay. Um, let's see, before I move to crim pro, any other crimes that we didn't really mention that you could think of? Does anyone know what that acronym BARC stands for? Yeah, it's burglary, arson, rape, robbery, kidnapping. What is that? It's the felony defenses. Mm -hmm. um, what does that mean, the felony defenses? Like, let's say you're being tried for felony murder. It's uh, one of those, like, plus, and then it leads to murder. The enumerated, the enumerated felonies that can underline a murder, that can underline a killing and be felony murder. So burglary, arson, robbery. Rape. Rape. Kidnapping. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Any other crimes we could think about that we didn't discuss? Inkaway crimes, arson, strict liability crimes, assault battery, theft crimes, murder, manslaughter, homicide. Like I said, there could be some criminal ordinances, criminal trespass, criminal contempt, criminal XYZ, but I think those are the main crimes, right? Any, anything on anyone's mind? Any crimes you want to talk about? All right, let's talk about quickly and then we'll go over some other things. The amendments. So at first I started off with the fourth, fifth, and sixth amendment. Just let's read them. The fourth amendment, the right of the people to be secured in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be seized and the persons or things being seized. This is the reasonable expectation of privacy. It stems from the fourth amendment, right? So, you know, if somebody breaks into your house to find evidence that's going to be a violation of the fourth amendment if someone looks over your fence and sees that you're growing some plants that you're not supposed to grow that's probably not a reasonable expectation of privacy because your neighbor could have looked over right you don't really have a reasonable expectation of privacy from a aerial view of your house now you do have a reasonable expectation of privacy if they're using some sort of uh equipment like to get penetrate the walls and, and thermal scan the inside. You know, if it's like, if it's something that's absurd, then you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. There's like, 
there's limits to this, you know, like they can't, the phone company can, or, you know, the court can't ask the phone company to get all your locations over the past year. You know, that's too voluminous and it's an invasion upon your privacy. Um, there's just certain aspects where maybe this right can be uh, diminished, but overall you do have a right to privacy. That's all stems from the Fourth Amendment. Um, I'll go to the Fifth Amendment and the Sixth, and we'll jump back. The Fifth Amendment, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment of an indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia, when actual service in time of war, public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law, nor private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So you see the Fifth Amendment, actually a lot stems from the Fifth Amendment. Um, one, the takings clause. Two, due process, de deprived of life, liberty, or property, right? But then for criminal law, we see shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself. So I plead the fifth. You know, if anyone ever watched the Chappelle show, that was one of his famous skits. I plead the fifth means you don't have to incriminate yourself. Shall any person be subject for the same offense to twice put in jeopardy of life or limb? So in civil procedure, we talked about claim preclusion, issue preclusion. Criminal law, we talk about double jeopardy. And we actually had a really good album from Alita. Uh, double jeopardy, can't catch me twice. It was like a playoff of a catch me if you can, but that's from the Fifth Amendment as well. Um, so yeah, we get a lot of, of good things from the Fifth Amendment. We also have the Fifth Amendment is gonna give us the Miranda rights. Does anyone remember what the Miranda rights are? Can anyone recite them like a 21 Jump Street? Right, you should remain silent. Um, anything you do can and will be used against you in the court of law and you have a right to an attorney. Mm -hmm. So when are people read Miranda rights? When there's a, a custodial interrogation. And can you give me some insights about when you're in custody and when you're not in custody? You're in custody when you feel like you can't leave. So more specifically, what's a, what's a, like a, you know, an example where people may think they're in custody, but they're not or vice versa. Uh, you're in custody when like you're in the back of a police car. And Are you're you not, if you're just like detained briefly, like on the side of the road. What about when they pull you over and, you know, hey, may I see your license and registration? No, you're not in custody yet. What? Um, anyone else have any insights about times you're not in custody that you might think you would be? Um, the same thing what y'all saying, like, uh, like when they pull you over, uh, for example, for me, like they, they like just pull me over once and just took off the key of my car and just like pull me out of the car quick, quickly and put me like in, uh, what's it called in, in the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So there you'd be in custody. Once they've taken you out of the car, you're on the sidewalk. And then they say, if they start asking you questions, before they start asking you questions about whatever you're being, you know, potentially uh, accused of, they would have to read you your Miranda rights. And if you unequivocally say, I want to see my lawyer or I'm not saying anything, then they have to stop all questioning. I so thought I thought the driver and passenger were allowed to be taken out of the car, um, like um, subject to like a lawful um, pullover or something like that. Right. I was kind of jumping to a more of an arrest. Like they're on the sidewalk, he said, and, you know, maybe they're doing questioning that is uh, more, um, more uh, substantial. But what are some, what, what is that called? If they're just doing a pat down of someone, if I'm just walking down the street and they want to pat me down, does anyone know what that's called? A Terry stop. Um, yeah, a Terry stop. And what are they really allowed to look for? Um, um, weapons? Yeah, weapons. It's really for weapons. All right, let's look at the Sixth Amendment. We'll, we'll jump back at all this stuff. Don't worry. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed 
which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against them, to have compulsory processes for obtaining witnesses in his favor and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Wow, just the use of all male, no, I'm just kidding. Um, Right, that's a Sixth Amendment. So Fifth Amendment is your right to counsel before adversarial proceedings have begun. Sixth Amendment is your right to counsel after the, the proceedings have begun. Um, I wanna step back to the exclusionary rule and the fruit of the poisonous tree. The exclusionary rule prevents the government from using most evidence gathered in violation of the United States Constitution. If evidence that falls within the scope of the exclusionary rule led law enforcement to other evidence, which they would not have otherwise located, then the exclusionary rule applies to the newly discovered evidence subject to a few exceptions. The secondarily excluded evidence is called fruit of the poisonous tree, right? So if you had a warrantless search and there was no exception to it, and it was a bad search, and that led you to something that led you to something else, well, all of that will be considered fruit of the poisonous tree and it will be excluded. That's the exclusionary rule. Um, Exceptions to when you need a warrant, this is important, right? Search incident to arrest, the plain view doctrine, the automobile search, valid consent to search, exit in circumstances, and like we just talked about, stop and frisk. Exit in circumstances, they test on the MBE. The police think that they're, you know, have a drug ring going on on, on room 407B. They knock on 407B and hear them flushing the toilet. Sounds like they're discarding evidence. They break in and find it. That's going to be exigent circumstances because they were flushing the toilet. The automobile search, you know, they, they do have a right to search through the automobile. Usually they yes. can't search the trunk unless they have probable cause. It's not good. It's, um, they can't search the trunk unless they have probable cause, but they can search everything else. Um, and especially the plain view doctrine comes in. If you, you know, have a warrant to search a house and you're looking for, you have an arrest warrant, right? I'm, I'm arresting this person. It's not even a search warrant, but as I'm making the arrest, I see something in plain view, then that'll be, uh, that'll be an exception. Now, if I go into the house and I'm trying to arrest Johnny and I get Johnny and I arrest him. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm already here. Let me do some snooping. And I go into the basement and I find some stuff in the closet. That's going to exceed the scope of the warrant, right? Does anyone have any uh, thoughts or um, details or insights about reasonable expectation of privacy, warrants, warrantless searches, probable cause, fruit of the poisonous tree, fourth, fifth, sixth amendment? Any of these issues so far? Anyone have any insights on? I had a question. Oh, sorry, Grace, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Lenny. Um, I did a question about plain view, um, but the police trespassed the, to the neighbor's, you know, to the suspect's neighbor um, property. And from the neighbor's property, they could see plain view, whatever was going on, but that's wrong. But that's know, yeah, it, it's wrong. Police can, the evidence, could be suppressed because the police trespassed to the neighbor. They didn't have permission from, they couldn't see from the street in the public public street. They trespassed to the neighbor's backyard. Right, but what if the neighbor were given permission? That, that's different. If okay. the neighbor gave permission. What, uh, any other insights from fourth, fifth, sixth amendment? Or May, you had a question, right? Yeah, no, I, I'm, I don't have a question. I meant like I had a, qu a practice question that I did um that I got wrong it was about um basically the point was you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in like your farm fields even if they're fenced in it was like oh, the police were I looking for they broke through the barbed wire and you're yeah. like no way and then they found some stuff in the fields and due to the open fields doctrine that was okay they were allowed to break through the barbed wire and find something that was in an open field because there's not a reasonable expectation of privacy on your open fields only your curtilage in your house so it's also in that exception too right what did you say like a barn like stuff that's inside a barn you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy for that right it's not your curtilage 
It's not in your curtilage. Exactly. It's in the open field. Exactly. Yeah. So they could potentially search your barn. Yeah. So like if you have marijuana in your barn, mm -hmm. the government goes there. No. I, I, about a barn is the thingy that you have in the backyard to, what's a barn? I'm thinking about like the little house to yeah, store like a it for storage. Yeah, no, that's a shed. A barn is for farm, oh. and it's more, it's bigger than a shed. It's literally on a farm, and it's like a big old where hay and horses live and stuff. Well, I saw one question where the, the police had a reasonable, um, how do you say that? Reasonable. They had a, they had an exception to a warrant. N um, no, they they thought that this person was um hiding as uh on you know someone they had a warrant for so a, a warrant to arrest yeah. not to search so they opened the shed and yeah the person was there hiding and it was okay because the shed was outside the curtilage of their house it was inside the house of the person they were um but they got into the house with permission of the owner of the house they just suspected like no he's hiding there you know because it was locked from the inside so they were like, that this is weird. So they opened up and it was okay because they had the warrant for arrest of the person they were looking for and the and they entered into the house with the permission. And you know what else they had? Most likely probable cause that he was there. Because That's the word I was looking for. Okay, great. So we have four, fifth, sixth amendment. Any other uh, questions or concerns before we move on a little bit? Um, that's a lot of crim pro comes down to. Um, grand jury proceedings, they're secret. The suspect has no right to confront witnesses or be at the proceeding. Witnesses are not entitled to Miranda warnings. Witnesses may not challenge a subpoena, but they may refuse to testify under the Fifth Amendment. So you still get your Fifth Amendment rights at grand jury. The exclusionary rule does not apply. For instance, an indictment can be based on evidence that would be inadmissible at trial, right? The rules of evidence do not apply at grand jury proceedings. Um, then I think this is the last crim pro slide. And again, before the cram guide details, we'll go over all these questions this afternoon. We're gonna have an amazing afternoon session. I wanted to keep the PowerPoint uh, brief as possible. But jury size and selection, jury size and unanimity, jury must contain at least six jurors. There's no constitutional right to a unanimous verdict. However, a six member jury verdict must be unanimous. So um, the jury composition requirements, the jury pool, the veneer, must be representative cross-section of the community. The actual jury does not have to be representative as long as the pool is representative. You have a right to an impartial jury. The defendant can question potential juries on possible prejudice or relevant to the case. Racial biases, feeling on the death penalty, ability to follow the laws written of you if they disagree with it. The defendant can challenge for cause based on prejudices and has unlimited challenges for cause of relevant to the case. Peremptory challenges cannot be used to exclude jurors on accounts of race or gender that would violate equal protection. All right, again, there's crim pro, a lot of stuff we could have talked about. I just want to make sure that we're good on the fourth, fifth, sixth amendment, probable cause, warrants, exceptions to warrants, and um, you know the main issues that are gonna come up. But we'll see on these cram guys exactly what we can expect. So Andrew. We, yes, that's me. All right, going back to the jury uh, question for a second. I had a question where, if the party stipulated to a non-unanimous jury and it was six members, that was allowed because the party stipulated to it. Right, if they stipulate that it's allowed, exactly. Yeah. It must be unanimous unless the parties consent to a non-unanimous jury. Right. Nice. All right, let's look at some cram guide information. A person is guilty of attempted murder when she takes a substantial step, mere than, more than mere preparation, toward completion of that crime with the intent that the murder takes place, right? Attempt to merge a substantial step more than the mere preparation. If a person is drugged and uncontrollably hits someone, it is not battery because they not, did not have the intent to commit the act that resulted in the offensive touching, right? They were basically hypnotized, they were compelled. If a robber asks a maid to leave the door so he can rob the house and the maid pretends but calls the cops, the robber can be found guilty of solicitation, but not conspiracy under the common law bilateral requirement for conspiracy since the maid never agreed to partake. Grace, that's exactly what you said. If a robber tells a clerk, give me the money or I'll hurt you, and she faints and hits her head, this is attempted robbery, but not assault 
because there was no overt act and words alone are insufficient. This is a tough question. Give me the money or I'll hurt you. And she faints and hits her head. That is attempted robbery, but not assault. It sounds like assault, right? But words alone are insufficient to be assault. There would have to be a little bit of a flinch, you know? If you know that you are buying stolen property, but you don't partake in the stealing of the property, you cannot be convicted of conspiracy to steal since you did not have any involvement in the theft. What can you be convicted of in that situation? Receiving stolen property. Receiving stolen property. Perfect. Strict liability, statutory rape and offenses, regulatory nature intended to prevent public harm. For example, laws about food safety levels are likely strict liability, right? That would be a regulatory example. Statutory rape is another great example. So, you know, good pointers on this slide. Um, M, you mind reading this slide? Sure. Um, if a neighbor goes out of town and leaves you the keys to enter the house and you have a party and someone steals money, the thief is guilty of larceny and you are not guilty of any crime. You are just a terrible neighbor. So in that situation, what happened? That you were given permission to babysit a house and then you decided to have a party in the house. Well, you haven't committed any crime because you had permission to babysit the house and invite people. But the person who comes to the party and steals money is certainly guilty of robbery or of larceny. It wouldn't be robbery unless there was force. So it's just larceny. Good job, man. Thanks. Uh, should I continue? Yeah, you can do the next, the next word. Burglary is a specific intent crime. It requires the intent to commit a crime therein, meaning if someone breaks into a building with no intent to commit a crime and then decides to commit a crime, it is not burglary. The intent to commit the crime must exist at the time of break-in. Nice. Usually the firing of a warning shot or something similar will constitute second-degree murder because it is a reckless disregard for human life. Just like we discussed. A defendant will only be held criminally responsible for the foreseeable consequences of her actions. For example, if a teacher makes a joke about student and the student commits suicide a year later, this is not manslaughter as the suicide was not a foreseeable consequence of the teacher's joke. Yeah, be careful. Teachers are sensitive too, you know? Homicide requires both result, result and causation. Causation requires that the defendant's conduct must be both the cause in fact and the proximate cause of the victim's death. For example, even if a dad is starving his child, but the child dies of untreatable cancer, the starving will not be the proximate cause of the death. Right. That makes perfect sense that like you, what you were doing could have uh, ended in murder or homicide or manslaughter. <laughs> But there was no causation, and there does need to be causation. Good job. Uh, Grace, you mind reading this page if you're with us? Okay. Um, murder is the intentional killing of another human being for malice of for what? Sorry. <laughs> of another human being with malice of forethought. Just being a, a witness to a murder does not constitute being an accomplice. To right. be that's like you know the gang you're the the gang is killing someone you're standing there watching right you're not a murderer you're just a witness to murder to be found guilty of attempted murder a defendant must have the intent to commit murder and take a substantial step toward the commission of murder if a defendant tries to shoot his neighbor but is out of the distance range but does not know he's out of the distance range. He's, this still constitutes attempted murder. Excellent. We talked about that. And the last one? Mm -hmm. um, the common law crime of false pretenses requires one, obtaining title, obtaining ownership rather than mere possession. Number two, by false misrepresentations must be intentional false state statements. Number three, of past or existing fact, misrepresentation of a future event does not qualify. Four, with the intent to defraud, the victim must be deceived or must act in reliance of the defendant's false statement in passing title. Obtaining property through false pretenses is a specific intent crime so the defendant must have a specific intent to defraud. Further, because it is a specific intent crime, a mistake on the part of the defendant, no matter how unreasonable, 
is a defense to the crime of false pretenses. For example, if someone steals something they think is rightfully theirs, they cannot be found guilty of false pretenses. Excellent. I never forget what false pretenses is. Um, let's see, Claudia, you mind reading this page? Which one was it again? This, just these three bullets right here. Oh, you want me to read the whole slide? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, a claim for factual impossibility occurs when the defendant makes a mistake concerning an issue or fact, such that if he had not been mistaken, he would, he would have known that his attempt had no possibility of success. The defense of factual impossibility has almost never been successful because impossibility is no defense where had the, oh, is no defense where had the facts been as the defendant believed them to be, there would uh, have been a crime. Exactly. A true legal, uh, legal impossibility defense arises when not only the defendant's completed actions could not have, could not possibly be a crime, but also even if the facts had been as the defendant believed them to be, no crime would have been committed. Thus, the defendant engages in conduct that he believes is against the law, but he has misconstrued the meaning of the statute and his actions are not in fact illegal. This is extremely rare. Uh, compared to a mistake of law where a defendant commits an illegal act but believes it to be legal, which is not proper defense. A hybrid case arises when a defendant makes a mistake that bears upon the legality of his actions. This means a defendant understands that the statute prohibits that the statute prohibits but mistakenly believes that the facts bring his uh, situation within the statute. A substantial major majority of courts today rejected the hybrid defense. For example, it is now standard practice for for undercover narcotics agents to sell suspects a substance that uh, purports to be narcotics or narcotic, but which is really sugar or some other narcotic. If the suspect makes a purchase, he will most likely, he will almost certainly be convicted of attempted possession of narcotics. Sorry, my dog was like jumping on the thing on the last one. Sorry, my life. But well done. This was all insights about factual impossibility, legal impossibility, and the hybrid case. So you can jump back to that slide if you want more insights. Um, and uh, P, can you read this page? Yeah. Uh, if you shoot a person intending to inflict harm and they die, you can properly be convicted of murder because you intended to inflict great bodily harm <clears throat> and it resulted in a killing. Uh, if you pickpocket a drunk person passed out on the street, you are guilty of larceny, even if you give up the property when you hear the police coming. Right, but you're not guilty of robbery because they're passed out. Uh, drunk driving through a playground to watch the kids run by accidentally killing one of the children constitutes murder under the reckless disregard and indifference of human life theory. Shooting a bullet at your neighbor's house because they are having a party and killing somebody at, at the party also constitutes murder on, on the same theory as above. Larceny by trick, <clears throat> larceny by obtaining possession through false statement or deception. False pretenses, similar to larceny by trick, but must obtain title. Uh, awesome. Um, and just uh, one thing I wanted to show for the last two minutes, and then we'll call it a day. Um, Sorry, just one second. Um. So most of those CRIM guide pointers that we saw were um, CRIM law, but just a couple CRIM pro. There's no expectation of privacy, something's visible to your neighbors. 
The standard for ineffective assistance of counsel claim is reasonable probability of a different outcome. Police must have probable cause to search a student's backpack and cannot circumvent the Fourth Amendment by making a principal or teacher conduct a warrantless search or search without probable cause for them. Maybe I should talk to a lawyer is not an unambiguous request for counsel after Miranda rights have been given. Both the driver and any passengers may be ordered to step out of a car during a lawful traffic stop. A, a, a common law assault is not a felony murder and cannot be the basis for felony murder claim. Um, a grand jury witness does not have a constitutional right to counsel inside a grand jury room. The exclusionary rule does not prohibit the admission of volunteer statements made outside interrogation. If a man confesses to a crime and he and his wife are tried together, but the man is not at trial, the confession is inadmissible because he cannot be cross-examined. In custody requirement for Randa is not met when a parolee visits a parole officer to answer some questions truthfully. They're not in custody at a parole hearing. Um, parties can agree to adhere to a non-unanimous jury verdict as Em was saying. Uh, any witness that's being called to testify must be identified at least 90 days before the trial begins. A final pretrial order may be amended only to prevent manifest injustice. Um, these are actually some civil procedure things. And then the very last one of the day, um, if someone is convicted of murder, they can later be charged with armed robbery ar arising out of the same event, but is a different crime with different elements and therefore not brought under double jeopardy. Now on the flip side, if someone was charged and convicted with armed robbery, they cannot be later charged with murder because it's a higher crime. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone got a little bit of crim pro before we ended the session, but we're gonna come back this afternoon. We'll do tons of crim law, crim pro questions. I hope you enjoyed today's session.